Hey, have you ever wondered why the buttons on video game controllers are like that? As someone who's played games with various controllers from Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox, I always thought it was weird that they're all functionally identical. Same amount of buttons, similar ergonomics, they do the same thing. Yet the button layouts are all different. Just the X button on the front is in a different place on all three major consoles. Oh, sorry, it's cross on PlayStation, but you get what I mean. I think it's strange that you can find a ton of history videos and books diving into all the other specifics of each piece of hardware, what processors the consoles used, who invented each major feature, but the button layouts are something that almost nobody talks about. Where did they come from? Why those buttons in that order specifically? Surely these layouts have a long history behind them, some sort of evolution that led to the controllers we have today. So I thought it would be fun to take a look at that history and try to piece it all together. Should be a quick, easy video to make. Very simple. Nothing to get into too much detail about. Just a quick, easy video. So the entire history of video game controllers goes something like this. Oh wait, hold on, before we continue the video, I should probably eat something first. I don't know about you, but I've been trying to cook more recently. Ordering out is too expensive, and fast food is way too unhealthy. So I've joined up with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, because they're offering fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a surprisingly low price delivered right to your door. Make good food a priority this year and choose from HelloFresh's biggest menu yet, with over 45 recipes and even more market items that can support your lifestyle. Just pick a recipe and a delivery date and HelloFresh will handle the meal planning and the shopping. So all you have to do is open your box of pre-portioned ingredients and get cooking. As someone who's a bit of a picky eater, I love that HelloFresh always has a ton of options for what to eat, so I can pick the ones that seem interesting and not have to worry about shopping for ingredients. And now, when you try HelloFresh, you'll get free dessert for life. That's right, every new subscriber gets one free dessert item per box for as long as you have an active subscription. So just click the link in the description or use my code and get 16 free meals plus free dessert for life while your subscription is active. That's 16 free meals and free dessert for life just by clicking the link in the description or using my code. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring the video. Back to the episode. One of the first games to ever be created, 1962 Space War, was fundamental in establishing what a controller even was. When the game was first created by hackers at MIT on a donated computer, it was originally controlled with the physical switches on the side of the console, which was not a great solution because if a player hit the wrong switch, they would just reset the entire machine. To fix this and make something more playable, the team working on Space War actually called over two members from the nearby Tech Model Railroad Club to help. And so Alan Kotok and Brandon A. Saunders would bring spare parts from a train set they were building and assemble that into one of the first video game controllers. Now, it is important to note that Tennis for Two created a nearly identical control box for their game four years earlier, but uh, that one doesn't have a good story behind it. <laughs> so as you'll notice, the levers on the Space War controller are meant for trains and not games, and only moved in one direction each. It wasn't until 1967 when Ralph Baer would be credited with creating the first multi-directional joystick for a video game, if only a prototype. He then forgot he did that when creating the Magnavox Odyssey in 1972 because they slapped a couple knobs on a toaster and called it a day. And a lot of early video game consoles honestly just threw ideas at the wall to see what stuck. Knobs, levers, the ColecoVision even added an entire numpad because they thought phones were cool. Pretty much every system had its own weird control scheme, and most of them were bad ideas. We wouldn't really see anything resembling a modern controller until the Atari 2600 in 1977, which popularized the joystick with its infamous CX-40 design. The Atari CX-40 was actually one of dozens of controllers released for the 2600, but it proved to be a huge hit in the mostly knob-dominated market. It was easy to use, easier to mass-produce, and used a standard controller port that could be plugged into basically anything. It's reported that at the height of its popularity, one in five homes in America had this joystick lying around somewhere. Now, of course, there were still a bunch of wacky-looking doohickeys that came out after the CX-40, some of which were made by Atari themselves, but we all know that none of these would last long, because in the 80s, a new console would be made by a former Japanese toy company that would revolutionize the world. You know it, I know it, let's all say it together now, the Epoch Cassette Vision. Uh, that's not the one you were thinking of? 
Okay, so the Cassette Vision is honestly not a very special console on its own. Its built-in controller sucked, actually, but I just wanted to highlight it because of these two buttons right here. Pretty much every home gaming system and arcade machine up until 1981 would have some variation of start, reset, clear, game select, player select, or power on it but none of these were standard. However, the Cassette Vision would prominently feature start and select, and being the highest selling console in Japan in the early 80s, it's easy to say it helped the convention stick. Though shortly after the Cassette Vision rocked Japan, the US would go through this little thing called the video game crash of 1983, where the bubble that supported all these crazy consoles burst, and the industry went from being worth $3 billion to just over 100 million in only a couple years. Companies like Epoch saw their sales hit a brick wall, Magnavox left the industry entirely, and Atari got hit so hard they had to pull a Walter White and bury their excess product in the middle of New Mexico. Things were bleak, and all of these goofy sci-fi inventions calling themselves controllers went up in a puff of smoke. It would take some real focused innovation and craftiness to pull out of this slump. Some might say, you'd have to leave luck to heaven. Okay, if you don't know, Leave Luck to Heaven is commonly assumed to be the translated meaning of Nintendo. In 1983, the Nintendo Famicom released in Japan and have the same impact on the video game market as McDonald's impact on childhood obesity. This console, and specifically its controller, would become the new blueprint which every other company would build on for the rest of time. You had the start and select buttons on controller one, a volume slider and weird little microphone that nobody ever used on controller two, and most importantly, a D-pad and two face buttons labeled A and B. Why A and B in that order? Shut up. Just the same way that the gaming industry lost $3 billion in just a couple years after 1983, when the Famicom became a smash hit in Japan and released in America as the NES, the industry gained two billion of those dollars back by 1988 with Nintendo making up over 70% of that. This one console basically saved gaming single-handedly, and so, of course, competitors rushed in to copy it. The Sega Master System, aka the Mark III, ditched the Mark I's joystick for a Famicom gamepad. The Atari 7800, which originally came with the Proline joystick they'd used for the 2600, re-released in Europe with a Famicom gamepad. The PC Engine, the official console companion to the PC-98 computer, came with a Famicom gamepad. If there was anything you could be sure of in the late 80s, it was that leg warmers would never go out of fashion, and a D-pad and two face buttons was the way video games were heading. However, in October of 1988, Sega would show the world a radical new idea. A third button. That's it, the Genesis just added a C button. And this gave Sega all the confidence of Peter Parker and Spider-Man 3 because they quickly started an ad campaign about all the stuff that Genesis does that Nintendo don't. Sure, you could chalk this up to Sega's console being 16-bit instead of the Famicom's 8, but I'd like to think it's all because of that third button. Oh, and they did also switch up the layout from BA to ABC for some reason. I don't know. So right around this time in the late 80s, fighting games were starting to become really popular. And where platformers and early RPGs could be best played with just A and B, Street Fighter in 1987 was best played with a six-button arcade layout. Now, it did originally have a two-button layout. A so-called deluxe arcade cabinet was released where you would just physically punch these oversized, pressure-sensitive buttons and do different attacks depending on how hard you hit them. But this version of the game only sold a thousand units compared to the six-button layout, which became one of the highest-selling arcade machines in all of Japan. I would really love to see someone win EVO with a punch pad type arcade stick though. Th somebody make that happen. By 1990, game companies knew that if you wanted to play games like Street Fighter, you needed more buttons. So Nintendo would answer this call with the Super Famicom controller. Same D-pad, same start and select, but now six entire action buttons. A, B, X, Y in an easy to reach diamond pattern on the front, and L and R on the back to be used as triggers. Now, it should be obvious why the L and R buttons are called that, but X and Y are a little more tricky. After all, the Neo Geo, released six months earlier and developed by Takashi Nishiyama, you know, the guy who made Street Fighter, had its four buttons labeled A, B, C, D. When asked about the X and Y, Shigeru Miyamoto himself actually gave this surprisingly insightful answer, saying, don't worry about it. From here, the evolution of controllers gets a lot more streamlined because we have the skeleton to build on and a clearer idea of where games are heading. Sega, of course, would still try to mix things up and add even more face buttons to the Saturn, this time with six, but even with ABCXYZ, the Saturn didn't see any sales outside of Japan. 
because while Sega thought they were Nintendo's arch nemesis, Sony would come in in the third act to show them they weren't even a side character. I think at this point everybody knows that the PlayStation started as a Nintendo product. Their collaboration with Sony to make a CD-based add-on to the Super Famicom that fell apart and got spun off into its own console. Which is why the controller on the PlayStation is just a Super Famicom controller with some grip slapped on. But it also sold 100 million units and did double the sales of the Super Famicom, so those grips were now a core feature of basically every controller for the rest of time. Something that Sony did come up with that nobody else replicated though is the symbols on their buttons. As the controller's designer, Teo Goto, explains, We wanted something simple to remember, which is why we went with icons or symbols, and I came up with the triangle circle cross square combination immediately afterward. I gave each symbol a meaning and a color. The triangle refers to viewpoint. I had it represent one's head or direction and made it green. Square refers to a piece of paper. I had it represent menus or documents and made it pink. The circle and cross represent yes or no decision making and I made them red and blue respectively. And the circle and cross, meaning yes and no, makes a lot more sense when you look at the Batsu and Maru symbols in Japanese, which basically mean yes and no or correct and incorrect and are often used for stuff like marking answers on a test. Meaning the layout of the PlayStation in Japan is actually just identical to that of the Super Famicom, with yes on the right and no on the bottom. What's interesting is that PlayStation decided to swap this layout for the West, making cross yes and circle no, something that would become standard for the company as the PS5 even changed the Japanese version of the console to match this Western layout, which makes zero sense. And alongside the buttons and the grips, the PlayStation also added additional triggers to their controller. Because where Sega and Nintendo were tiptoeing into the 3D game space, PlayStation went all in very early. And these triggers were the start of that, as they were used to help with three-directional movement by allowing you to stray for look up and down. Though the real switch into 3D came with Nintendo's response to the PlayStation, and the inclusion of analog. Taking the concept from flight controls, the N64's analog joystick gave you the ability to not only move in 8 directions instead of 4, but press it just part way for more controlled movement. The N64 also did a lot of other really weird shit, because alongside shaping itself so Aquaman could use it as a weapon, it moved B and A around so B was on top, then replaced X and Y with 4 C buttons, and removed select entirely. The controller's third leg also meant a third trigger, which Nintendo called the Z button. This would definitely suggest that Nintendo was taking notes from Sega, having a layout way closer to the Saturn, even down to the C and Z buttons and no select. Though the other more clear inspiration was the Virtual Boy of all things, because that controller also had grips and two D-pads for additional control. Now this is where we make that final jump to the modern layout we opened the video with. Because when PlayStation figured out analog was the way to go midway through the PS1's life cycle, they created the DualShock, which set the formula that every PlayStation controller would follow to this day. And the formula that basically every other controller would follow, as Sony's next system, the PS2, became the highest selling console of all time in 2000, doing about triple the sales of everything else on the market combined. I'd argue that the Super Famicom gamepad is still technically more influential, but the DualShock is a close second, because every modern controller is basically just riffing on it. Two analog sticks, analog triggers, clickable L3 and R3 buttons, they even went overboard and made the face buttons pressure sensitive too, which has never been used well in a game ever and I will die on that hill. Though, while Sony was making all the big obvious developments, what happened at Sega was arguably much more interesting. Because with the release of the N64 happening during the Saturn's lifetime, the team quickly tried to counter with an analog controller of their own. Specifically, the 3D pad that coincided with the release of Knights. It had all the basic features of the N64 controller in an equally strange circle layout, and though it didn't have full analog capabilities, you had to switch between using the D-pad or the stick, it did put the stick up above the D-pad, which might seem strangely familiar. Fast forward a couple years to 1999, and the Dreamcast would release with that old 3D pad at the core of its controller's design. It also had a slot to put in memory cartridges with screens on them, and for once in Sega's life removed buttons from their competitor's design, settling on a colorful ABXY layout that might also seem strangely familiar. The Dreamcast did not sell well though, and Sega was pretty much on their last legs at this point. Having been completely overtaken by Sony and Nintendo, the team actually looked to Microsoft of all places for help. 
Hearing that they were developing a new console, Sega chairman Isao Okawa reportedly asked Bill Gates personally to add some form of cross-functionality between their systems. And while the negotiations ended up falling apart and Sega's hardware branch went under, the Xbox would release a few years later with a suspiciously Dreamcast-shaped controller. Or really, it's not suspicious at all. The early prototype designs for the Xbox Duke straight up ripped off Sega because, quote, apparently the designer's kids had a Dreamcast. And even if you had no idea there was a direct connection, I think you could pretty easily tell just by looking at the controllers that Microsoft was taking obvious inspiration. The most important inspirations being that colorful ABXY layout and a left analog stick above the D-pad. And that's kind of it for the major history. PlayStation would continue innovating on the DualShock all the way up to the PS5 with its DualSense controller. The original Xbox Duke was considered way too big for people's hands and got redesigned in Japan to be more ergonomic. Then after that, Microsoft also just iterated on their new design up until the Xbox One X Series X2 X-Men United or whatever console we're currently on. In 2013, the Ouya controller came out. And Nintendo, well, they just kept doing weird shit. The GameCube came out in a time when dual analog sticks weren't quite the norm yet, so it still had a weird C-stick on the right and only three triggers. And they also brought X and Y back, but moved them to orbit around the A button. The Wii also made huge changes, putting B on the back as a trigger and then adding one and two as extra buttons. But as weird as this controller had to be to accommodate motion controls, it was also accompanied by the Wii Classic controller, which later became the Pro Controller series which are just DualShocks with Super Famicom buttons. Really, the only major thing to change for modern controllers in terms of button layouts was also the first thing that ever became a standard, Start and Select. Because years after every console adopted these buttons into their controller, the words themselves kinda stopped having meaning. Originally coming from arcade machines and early computers, they didn't have any direct use in modern games. You didn't actually have to press start to start the game or press select to select something. And even the Xbox's back button that they had since the Duke was kind of a holdover. So starting with the PS4, Sony decided to spice things up a little, changing the buttons to share and options, but also adding a clickable trackpad that gained all the functionality of the old select button. The Xbox One and PS5 then just added weird hieroglyphs. I don't know what these are supposed to be, but they basically act as start and select alongside some third button usually meant for sharing things online. Because, hey, social media has existed for almost two decades now, might as well add a button for that. So now, in the year of our lord 2024, we come back around to those three major controllers from three major competitors that are all incredibly similar in design, but as we found out, actually have complex interconnected histories. Nintendo's current face button layout is still the same as the Super Famicom, PlayStation took that Super Famicom layout and created their own symbols to parallel it, and Xbox's face buttons can be traced all the way back to the Sega Saturn. All of these controllers have clickable dual analog sticks and triggers like the DualShock. They all have menu buttons like the Cassette Vision that they all changed into their own symbols after Start and Select fell out of fashion. And starting with the PS3 and Xbox 360, they even added little logo buttons to take you back to the home screen. So that's it, the complete explanation for the layout of modern video game controllers. I think it all fits together quite nicely. We have a good idea where everything came from, and this video was pretty quick and easy for me to make. Right at the end here, I only really have one small question that I still want to answer. Why the fuck did Nintendo label their buttons backwards? So if you've been paying really close attention to the video thus far, you might have noticed there's actually a couple holes in our timeline here. Several decisions made about controller designs that I haven't talked about, and I left these until the end on purpose. Because controller button layouts, as you might imagine, are an incredibly niche topic. These are arbitrary decisions made by designers several decades ago that they probably didn't think was that important, and many of these designers have sadly passed away, so very little is officially written about this. The only person who ever really explained their reasoning was Teyu Goto for PlayStation, and that was just the symbols, not the layout. They never even talked about why they switched Circle and Cross for North America. The Nintendo design team never once wrote down why they picked A, B, X, and Y. And they certainly don't talk about why they put them backwards, or why no other company has ever done that. While the timeline of controller layouts we went through so far was fun and easy to make, 
These deeper mysteries are why I even looked into this topic in the first place, because they are mysteries. Why we have ABXY or why it's different on every controller, these aren't questions that you can find conclusive answers for. Or at least after weeks of research, I couldn't. What I did find after digging through hundreds of articles, reading dozens of books and interviews, and even reaching out to game historians for more info was possible answers to these questions. Ones that I think fit quite nicely and can still give us a good idea of what was going through the designers' heads. So let me tell you what I found. The Nintendo Famicom controller, like any great invention, was actually the result of collaboration between several talented people. More specifically, the minds of Gunpei Yokoi, Masayuki Uramura, and the people they led at Nintendo's R&D departments 1 and 2. Gunpei Yokoi had actually been at the company for a while and was originally a toy designer. He's the one responsible for the Ultra Hand, NES Zapper, and Rob. The one of his arguably most influential creations was the Game & Watch in 1980. Yukoi took inspiration from LCD calculators at the time to make a portable gaming system, and in order to make a playable game on that small of a device, he had to get creative with the control scheme. Specifically, when looking to adapt the arcade version of Donkey Kong, he saw that a joystick wouldn't work, so he decided to shrink it down to just four buttons arranged in a plus shape. And with that, he invented the D-pad. Fast forward a couple years to 1982, and Nintendo was looking to step into the world of home consoles. The head of this new project, Masayuki Uemura, had to come up with a controller design that would accommodate all of the games that would be playable on the device. Other controllers at the time were all over the place, but early on, Uemura's design spec for the Famicom locked down what they wanted. A joystick, start button, pause button, and two decision buttons. Nintendo R&D team number two, under Uemura, worked hard to find something that fit. Disassembling arcade joysticks and other consoles to mash together buttons and levers, but nothing was quite comfortable. That is, until a fellow developer, Takeo Sawano, who had previously worked at R&D Department No. 1 under Yokoi, suggested they look at the Game & Watch. As the story goes, Uemura and the team scoffed at the idea, so Sawano wired a Game & Watch controller up to the prototype Famicom and asked them to play on it. And as each designer took a turn with the controller, they fell in love. And here's where the story leaves out anything to do with buttons. Nothing is written about the decision to label A and B. The book that I'm getting most of this information from, I Am Error, goes into extremely specific detail about every other facet of the Famicom's creation. And it is a fantastic read, I'll link it in the description. But even after reaching out to the author directly, they couldn't give me anything more about the backwards buttons. Uemura just never elaborated on that decision. So here's my theory. If you look at that original Donkey Kong Game & Watch, you can see that it only has one labeled action button, jump, and it's placed pretty much exactly where the A button would go. So the most likely idea I have is that because Uemura's spec needed two buttons and the jump was already comfortable as is, the secondary button just got added off to the left. Then as for the labels, the entire Game & Watch lineup had Game A and Game B written on them which was a holdover from even back in the 2600 era with its difficulty switches. So labeling the buttons with that probably just felt natural. And the label order just came down to A being primary and B being secondary. Or using the idea of decision buttons, A for accept, B for back. This is something that I think is backed up especially well by Nintendo changing the button layouts for the N64 and GameCube, making A much more obviously the primary action button. Though there is a common theory that they're labeled backwards because Japanese is traditionally written right to left, but that's only traditional Japanese. Modern Japanese is written left to right, and also uh, so is English, which is what the controllers are labeled with. So that's why the Famicom looks like that, but what about all the other controllers? Looking into pretty much every console ever made, I found out that basically none of them labeled B and A backwards like this. The consoles that used Famicom gamepads, like the Sega Master System, Atari 7800, and the PC Engine, did use two buttons, and the PC Engine even had them labeled right to left, but they used one and two instead. And of course, the most important change was the Genesis switching to ABC left to right. My initial theory for this was that it had something to do with copyright, that Nintendo somehow patented or trademarked these labels. But looking into it further, while Nintendo does have patents for their exact controller technology, like the specific type of D-pad Yokoi invented, the labels on the buttons aren't mentioned. And that seems like something too broad to trademark anyways. Though, interestingly enough, the only controllers I could find that do have a backwards A and B were the Atari Jaguar and Lynx 
which both have additional buttons that would have probably made them legally distinct. To me, it is likely that other controller designers, even if legally in the clear, probably wouldn't have wanted to mess with Nintendo anyways. But a much more probable reason is that they just didn't understand the backwards thing, or they wanted to be different. And this applies to Sega especially. Their main R&D department, under Hideki Sato, created the Mark I console as Sega's first entry into the space, and just so happened to release it on the same day as the Famicom, which massively outsold it. I would imagine it would be very hard not to hold a grudge after having that happen, so Sato, who supervised the same R&D teams for the Mark II and Genesis, could very easily have just wanted to avoid labeling their buttons the same way as Nintendo, even after taking the Famicom's general controller design for later systems. However, a big piece of the puzzle comes from product designer Mitsushigi Shiraiwa, because while Sato overlooked R&D altogether, and the team lead, Masami Ishikawa, actually created the internals, Shiraiwa created the case of the Genesis and its controller before anything else was done. They say that Sega mainly wanted a controller meant for a worldwide audience, specifically something easy to use for both the small hands of Japanese children and the hands of Western adults. Which, to me, says that it is very likely Sega made the letters alphabetical to cater to a Western audience. Something backed up by the fact that in 1993, just 10 years after getting their butt kicked by the Famicom, Sega actually took 55% console market share in America. Mostly because of their focus on that market with games like Sonic the Hedgehog and their uncensored release of Mortal Kombat. This is pretty hard to look into though, because some of the only information about Shira Iwa you can find online is an article from a Brazilian toy blog that's somehow referenced by Wikipedia, and an exclusive interview locked behind a Kickstarter coffee table book from 2013 with no physical or digital copies available. So this is what I've spent the last month or so of my life working on. <laughs> The Super Famicom is where things get a little bit weirder too, because the decision to label the extra face buttons X and Y feels way more random than A and B. I did find a couple prototypes for the controller floating around that even labeled the buttons A, B, C, D, E, and F. So if this is to be believed, at one point the buttons were alphabetical, at least internally. Changing E and F into L and R is still obvious to me, that's way more intuitive, but of course, nothing is written about X and Y, so my main theory is a combination of a couple things. One, the Neo Geo did come out earlier with an ABCD layout, which combined with the Genesis may have forced a decision to change the letters. Two, C and D would be easier to mix up with A and B, especially for people who don't know English. And three, X and Y, just like A and B, are very common pairs of letters in mathematics and programming, which Nintendo engineers would have probably been familiar with. So all of this could have easily led to Uemura and his team, who also designed the Super Famicom, to pick the ABXY layout that we all know today. The specific diamond pattern though, as influential as it is, might have been a bit of a mistake, or at least the specific order was. Because while that earlier prototype design had A on the bottom and B on the left, the final controller put A on the right and B on the bottom. This still makes logical sense, the controller follows the backwards convention of the Famicom to be familiar, but A was no longer the most comfortable button anymore. In fact, in Super Mario World and quite a few other games, the B button was now jump and confirm, with A relegated to a secondary spin jump. And if you'll remember back to like 60 seconds ago, the Genesis had majority market share in America by the early 90s, with its confirm button being A on the bottom left. So what this all leads to is our next big undocumented decision, PlayStation swapping what Cross and Circle do in North America. I have read so many people saying that the buttons were swapped because people in the US thought cross meant yes and circle meant no, but I'm going to be honest with you, I have no idea in what world anyone would think that. X is clearly no to me if we're just going by symbols, and tons of North American PlayStation games actually used triangle as the back button, even up to Vice City on the PS2. So the circle button wasn't even consistently back until years later. The real, far more likely story to me is that people in the US were just way more comfortable with the bottom button being confirmed, because of the popularity of the Genesis in Super Mario World. 
Circle and Triangle then sort of fought over who would become the back button, up until the Dreamcast and Xbox came out and made that more standard. But all of this was pretty much decided entirely on a game-by-game -game basis, as Kojima famously said fuck it and made Circle confirm on the US release of Metal Gear Solid. While it does help that Batsu and Maru don't mean anything to Americans, I don't think Sony actually cared that much about the symbols. I mean, they changed the layout in Japan, where the buttons do actually mean something. So it's pretty clear to me that comfort and conformity were much higher priorities to them. And that's actually the common thread for all of these decisions about buttons and layouts, because they are very arbitrary. However much thought went into them obviously wasn't enough to really talk about or write down anywhere. And all of us playing on these consoles at home probably never noticed or really cared, because you just knew that this was a Nintendo controller and this was a PlayStation controller, and that's what they look like. Nintendo just puts the A and B backwards, that's just how it is. But after obsessing over these buttons for hours and hours, I can't help but find it interesting how even a simple thing like button layouts can really reflect the mindset of the people who made it. Gunpei Yokoi and Masayuki Uemura famously followed a design philosophy that propelled Nintendo into success, by creating hardware meant to be just as fun as the games that used it. Yokoi specifically had an adage of lateral thinking with withered technology that he later went on to use to create the Game Boy. The Nintendo R&D teams clearly didn't care about the technical side of things if it meant making something easy and intuitive instead, even if it meant putting the A and B buttons backwards. Meanwhile, Hideki Sato at Sega was always trying to one-up Nintendo at every turn, trying to create hardware that was more powerful or had more features, even if it wasn't more intuitive. Nothing really says that more to me than the Genesis controller, clearly trying to look like it had more face buttons than the Famicom, even though in reality it had the exact same number of buttons because there was no select. And the alphabetical layout of these buttons not only follows that competitive spirit, but showcases Sega's clear focus on the American market that accounted for a lot of their success. I haven't talked about it nearly enough, but these two companies having this big split in the way they design their controllers really is the pivotal moment in the history of button layouts, because they would go on to influence every other console manufacturer that came afterwards. Teo Goto at PlayStation, for example, took obvious hints from Nintendo, they straight up say that PlayStation was trying to get people to upgrade from the Super Famicom, so they mirrored its controller and upgraded it with better buttons, better ergonomics, and cleaner shapes. They even followed it so closely they had to backpedal the cross and circle buttons because the layout wasn't comfortable in North America. Meanwhile, Xbox clearly took all their ideas from Sega. I don't think I can be more clear about that. They wanted the American market share, so they learned from the company that captured it and they were going head-to-head -head with PlayStation just the same way that Sega went up against Nintendo. The original Xbox Duke even redesigned itself to be smaller in Japan, exactly like the Sega Saturn did with its controller years earlier. So it's very funny to me that despite saying no to cross-platform support, Microsoft arguably just carried the Dreamcast legacy to this very day, turning its layout into one of the most highly regarded controller designs of all time. I don't know, I am almost definitely looking too deep into all this, but that's why I like making videos on these topics. I wanted to solve some mysteries that are probably unsolvable, and I'm not sure how satisfying my answers to these questions are, but the fact that I can get broader meaning out of where people decided to put buttons 40 years ago is fascinating to me. I think a lot of the history of video games and other media is weirdly interconnected like this, and that's why it's so fun to learn about. Ultimately, I don't know what the message of a video like this is supposed to be, I have no idea if any of this information is new to you or if you even care, but to me, just putting together why controller button layouts are like that is interesting enough, and I hope you feel the same. Thank you for watching. I keep screwing myself over by saying that my next video is going to be simple and then I go ahead and make something like this. But as a famous poet once said, God has cursed me for my hubris and my work is never finished. Maybe this time I'll say that my next video is going to be super complicated and long and heavily researched. That way I can take a break and put out something light. I don't know. If you like the video and you want to support the creation of more like it, go ahead and check out my Patreon. It's just a dollar and gets you all my stuff ad free and uncut. Also your name goes in the credits like all these cool people. And hey, show some love to the sponsor HelloFresh, because if you use my code at checkout, you will get 16 free meals and free dessert for life, which is a lot of food. And who doesn't like free food? So go check them out in the link in the description down below. As always, 
I'll see you next time.